The first case is a 33-year-old male who comes to the eMERGE department with a fever, abdominal pain and back pain. He says he's had a two-week history of upper respiratory tract symptoms and fevers up to 39 at home. He has two daughters. They also had upper respiratory tract infections, but their symptoms all resolved about a week ago. So his past medical history is not really contributory, doesn't help all that much. And this is what we get on physical exam. So um, his vital signs, he has bilateral cervical lymph nodes that are about 1.5 centimeters. His cardiac and respiratory exams are essentially unremarkable. His abdo exam is diffusely tender and there's some hepatosplenomegaly. And he has this maculopapular exanthem on his chest. It looks like wheel-shaped um, lesions. And he has asymmetrically painful joints in his fingers. So um, I'd like to turn to the residents and see what you're thinking in terms of a differential diagnosis at this point. So even if you want to start with a PGY-1, maybe start with the vitals, anything abnormal that you see there or concerning at all? Stone. <laughs> um, so uh, they have a temperature of 39, uh, tachycardic, um, slight increase in their uh, respirate, uh, and BPs uh, concerning uh, as well. Uh, sorry, how old was this person? 33 years old, male. Previously healthy? Yep, previously very healthy. Yeah, so, uh, worried about sepsis. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think sepsis is a great thing to have on your differential. With this presentation, are there any sources in particular you might be thinking about? Mm-hmm. Why differential? Uh, yeah. There. Uh, I'm not really sure what to make of the skin. Uh, yep, so I agree with you. I think um, I'll pick on someone else, uh, maybe another PGY-1 or PGY-2. I'm looking for a kind of broad strokes. So if you have a patient who you think may have sepsis, what are the types of things that you need to rule out when you don't know where your source might be? So what are possible sources of infection? Anything really broad? Does anyone else have something to add with that? So I guess normally we start like looking at like we get like a chest x-ray to see if it's like respiratory cause, pneumosepsis or urosepsis, again like the abdomen so you can with this like you might get an abdomen like say abdo x-ray um, or CT depending on how he examines and then uh, also then also with the joints uh, it'd be strange for multiple joints to present with septic arthritis but you know, something you always think about when you kind of think about that as well. And then look for any like cellulitic changes as well, but it seems it doesn't really seem to be a cause for this as well. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's excellent. So you're going through with sepsis, the different things, um, just go systems wise or head to toe. So you've got palpable lymph nodes. Could there be a neck infection, a deep space infection? Can you have a pneumonia after upper uh, respiratory tract infection? You've got a patient who's got a diffusely tender abdomen. Is there um, an abscess or something. So you really want to think about all your systems when you have a patient who presents this unwell and you don't really have a cause and that'll help you determine kind of investigations. Um, one other thing uh, which is interesting to think about, so I'll just show what we had on our differential. So sepsis, as we talked about all the different areas, I threw CNS infections on there because they're important to always think about when someone's very unwell, but in this case without any mental status changes it's probably unlikely, so that's fair that it wasn't mentioned. Um, but the other thing to think about in someone who has uh, a diffusely tender abdomen is hypotensive and tachycardic. Um, you can always have spontaneous organ ruptures sometimes with viral illnesses, very rare, but uh, something to think about if someone's very unwell, um, especially with the hepatosplenomegaly. So uh, one more resident, I'll pick on Davey because he hid in the corner. Um, any thoughts on your initial management or investigations? 
potential management. You'd like to start IV fluids. You'd like to start antibiotics, broad spectrum from the get-go. Um, in addition to that, um, I would, as Brad alluded to, your initial investigation is to stabilize. So your chest x-ray, you want to get a urinalysis. You want to do a thorough physical exam to make sure um, you're not missing any um, kind of the minutia. Um, aside from that, um, I would ultrasound his belly off the get-go to make sure his aorta is okay. Um, and from then on, I would probably order a CT abdominal pelvis to make sure that this gentleman doesn't have an intra-abdominal kind of catastrophe. Okay, and other than your basics, is there anything you'd want to add to your blood work? So, labs, so CBC lights, uh, urea, creatinine, blood cultures, urine cultures, um, and CK tropes. Awesome. So I agree completely. Resuscitation, blood work, imaging, those are your priorities right now. So here's the blood work you've initially gotten back. Um, and I'd like someone to comment if you don't know what they are with the the pattern feel free to um, ask for clarification but um, does anyone see any abnormalities in this blood work that they might be a little concerned about so i'm going to pick on mark um, patients uh, can't cite a penic i'm assuming the one on my right is the red blood cells and left is uh, platelets yeah so hemoglobin is 100 platelets are 89 and then that's white blood is uh, 1.8 at the top so there so pancytopenic uh, creatinine is uh, slightly elevated uh, what i would expect at this uh, this age um, and then um, lfts usually have to look at the color on the screen a bit, uh, but they look <laughs> the, mildly mildly elevated yeah you're exactly right they're a tiny bit up but not anything that would normally be very alarming to us. Um, and then uh, Davey had asked for some imaging. Your pocus was normal, there was no AAA, um, and, uh, and the chest x-ray, abdo CT, essentially unremarkable except the hepatosplenomegaly, which you also got on your physical exam. So with this blood work and results, is there anything anyone would add to their differential that we had before? Mark? Yeah? And then I guess uh, vasculitis could also present like this. And with the pancytopenia, there, um, if he's septic and he's also got some sort of myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. Yeah. So the big thing we were thinking was kind of along the lines of myelodysplastic um, blood disorders. So uh, just this is the same differential as before. And we were thinking malignancy is something big we would add on to that differential. And then there's a few things that we can cross off. Um, unlikely to be an intra-abdominal process with the normal CT, pneumonia unlikely with the chest x-ray, and then those hemorrhages also unlikely with that abdo CT. So that's the first case. Uh, just keep it in the back of your minds. We're going to jump to a second case and then we'll talk about them uh, together after that. So our second case is a younger patient. This is a 16-year-old girl. Um, you're on PEDS ICU, you're a resident. It's 10.30 at night and you get a phone call saying that there's a patient coming from a peripheral hospital. As I said, she's 16 years old. She's had shortness of breath, a sore throat, and abdominal pain, and that's what she came into the peripheral eMERGE with. She's had a two-week history of upper respiratory tract infection. She was initially treated out of hospital at a walk-in clinic with amoxil, and she developed a rash with that. And then uh, she also had a positive monospot test. She is febrile and hypotensive in their eMERGE. They've initially admitted her to hospital, but she's continuing to be unresponsive to resuscitation. So she's hypotensive and she's receiving large amounts of fluid and uh, antibiotics. So they're asking for a transfer to the pediatric ICU for additional support. So the paramedics wheel the patient in. While they're wheeling the patient in and getting her transferred to a bed, hooked up to monitors, you get a bit of a past medical history, which again, this is a previously very healthy young lady, um, unhelpful really past medical history, and her initial vitals are as you see here. She looks um, very sick, but she is conscious and alert and able to speak to you um, between the fast respirations. 
So the nurse asks you as she's setting up the monitors, what would you like to do now? What's your first priority? So again, a first or second year um, resident, anyone like to comment on your first priority when you have a patient like this come into your ICU? Nick, I see you. I haven't picked on you. So on arrival, I think the standard uh, answer and obvious answer would be ABCs, right? Perfect. So make, um, ABCs and end of the bed. So make sure the airway is paid and the patient's breathing. Are there any, any respiratory distress? Is there any um, tracheal deviation, equal air entry bilaterally? Um, these types of things. Uh, this is obviously not a trauma. I uh, think a more infectious cause. So. Um, um, good pulses and pressure, uh, super important. So uh, they've been given antibiotics, albeit not super broad spectrum. Um, uh, so I mean, that may be something to consider uh, to broaden the spectrum of coverage, given that you don't truly know what you're dealing with. Uh, fluids would be very important, given the patient's hypotensive, and um, you know whether they respond to fluid or not. That dictate whether they were uh, severe sepsis, septic shock, and pressers at that point down the line and I, I think uh, searching for a causative agent and really getting a better collateral as to um, that's been the cursory history but is there anything that may have been missed earlier on that's now manifesting? Yep absolutely so I think that's the perfect answer ABCs this patient's obviously sick we are tachycardic um, we have low blood pressure and a very fast respirate so um, completely agree let's gather more information as you said. So you do a very thorough physical exam and you see that the patient is lethargic, unwell as you knew from the bedside. Uh, the RESP exam, you just notice that there's increased work of breathing and her abdomen is diffusely tender, it's distended and you can palpate both the spleen and the liver about four centimeters below the costal margin. Uh, she has no rashes and uh, nothing really on her MSK exam. So um, you take a look at the blood work that was done uh, in the peripheral hospital, and this is what you see initially. So um, can I have someone else comment on any part of this blood work? You can choose just one, or um, if you'd like to tackle all of it, that'd be great. Davey's pointing at someone. Sorry, can I just ask you one point I'd be thinking in this? Yep. If you know someone has EBV, which is what I thought we should also do in the first person, there's two things you always have to think about. One is, especially with the pulse pressure like that, they get anaerobic infection, particularly Fusobacterium necroforum, which can kill you very quickly. So most of us do vancocaftriaxone. You don't have anaerobic coverage. So that's one thing that's an unusual situation in a previously young health. Anaerobic infection is so rare, but that's the setting of it. And then personally, I do a ferritin. Fair enough. We may talk about that in a second. Um, but for now, we'll look at this blood work and we'll get back to that point. Um, so would anyone uh, like to comment on this blood work? Yeah. So you, just, you can just list them. You don't have to talk about them in depth. Just point out the abnormalities. Looks like the patient has a metabolic acidosis. Yeah. Um, Trying to figure out which one's the hemoglobin and which one's the platelets. Hemoglobin is 90, 47 is platelets. Okay, they're both low. Um, and has an acute kidney injury. I'm trying to calculate the anion gap in my head. Eh, don't worry about the anion gap. Sweet. It's not a blood gas question. And has some obvious um, elevations of uh, paddock transaminases. Absolutely. So. Um, then you also look at their blood work and the very astute physicians in the peripheral hospital ordered a ferritin, a triglyceride level, and an LD level. So I'm going to look at the more senior residents, so PGY 3s or 4s. Um, if you have any thoughts on this, if you don't, I may defer over here um, for why we order a ferritin in this type of case. No thoughts? It's totally fair. This is a weird and wonderful um, type of case, so I don't expect people to, to know this. I definitely didn't before I presented this. Um, 
These numbers are all elevated, in case you weren't uh, totally clear and look for the color on power chart, but 34,000 is an extremely high ferritin. Anything over 500 is usually considered uh, quite elevated. So would you like to comment about the ferritin? You brought it up. Well, sure. <laughs> I will be talking about it too, but. Yeah, so with many infectious processes, but EBV in particular, in a previously healthy child, and that's actually quite a high liver. Um, those are high livers in this area, and she's pancytopenic. Um, and when you can feel the liver and spleen, you have to worry about hemophagocytic syndrome, so HLH. And uh, any ferritin over 10,000 is diagnostic. And it's, uh, you have to take a real turn in your treatment because you actually treat them with chemotherapy. Um, I honestly can't say how common it is in the adult world. It, I would say it's relatively newly recognized in the last 10 or 15 years of pediatrics, and it's way more common than you think. So that was a lovely preview. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so on our differential, very similar things to what we talked about with the last patient. So infection, any type of infection is still on our list. Malignancy with the pancytopenia. Um, an immune inflammatory disorder like a macrophage activation syndrome or HLH and complications of EBV, um, since we have a known EBV patient, any lymphoproliferative disorder, which includes HLH, and a splenic rupture. So what did both these patients have? They both had HLH. So HLH is hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. I will only say that once because it's a bit of a mouthful. But uh, HLH is a clinical syndrome. It's caused by severe hypercytokinemia, and it's usually due to highly stimulated but ineffective immune response. It is not a disease on its own, but it's uh, viewed as the consequence of either an inherited or required inability of the immune system to cope with a trigger, and that trigger is usually an infectious agent. So what that all means essentially is that your immune system is producing an insane amount of cytokines, it's hyperactivated, and this is usually caused by either a genetic um, predisposition or someone acquires it and an infectious trigger leads them into this um, severe uh, presentation. So generally, HLH uh, was first described in 1952, so rather new um, diagnosis. It used to be called familial hemophagocytic reticulosis. There's only about one to 10 cases per one million people annually. So it's very, very uncommon. And there's two forms. There's a primary or familial form, and then there's a secondary or acquired form. And uh, traditionally, as was mentioned, this was thought to be a pediatric diagnosis, but over the last decade or so, more and more cases of the acquired form have been recognized in the adult population. And so we're becoming more aware of it um, in these age groups. Unfortunately, this illness has an extremely poor prognosis. So without treatment, the median survival used to be one to two months. And 95 to 100% of people with this illness would pass away. Fortunately, with treatment, things have gotten a bit better, but it's still not great prognosis. The familial or primary form has a five-year survival, about 66% with our best offered treatments. And the acquired form, which is more common in adults, uh, has a 50% mortality, despite our best treatment. EBV uh, and malignancy, hematologic malignancies in particular, uh, carry the worst prognosis if they are thought to be the triggering cause. And rheumatologic disorders can also be a trigger, and they have a slightly better prognosis with only um, 8 to 22 percent mortality. So even the better prognosis is still pretty grim. So I'll first talk about the familial type. This is the more pediatric um, type. So this is uh, accounting for 25 percent of pediatric cases, and there's only about 1.2 cases per million children annually. So again, very rare about an even distribution between males and female. And the incidence is in very young children. So highest incidence is less than three months, which makes sense when we're talking about a genetic uh, disorder. And then about 75% of these cases of the familial um, primary HLH are in children under the age of two. 
So there's multiple genetic mutations associated with uh, HLH, but all of these mutations affect the same pathway, which I'll discuss a little bit later, but they all affect the way your natural killer cells respond to uh, immune stimulation. The second form is acquired uh, HLH. So this is what we'll see normally with adults. Um, this was initially described in transplant patients in 1979. It can occur, however, in uh, otherwise healthy or immunocompetent patients. There is a bit more of a predisposition towards uh, females, so it's a one to seven ratio. And for whatever reason, we don't know at this point, um, there is a predisposition in Japan where 50% of the adult cases have been reported. Uh, this may be that they happen to recognize it more in Japan, or there may actually be some underlying predisposition, but the research is just not there to tell us what that is. And then as I've mentioned, there's three triggers, so we'll go into depth with those triggers. Malignancy is uh, the first one. It can occur in about 1 to 20% of uh, patients with a hematologic malignancy. And NK or T cell lymphomas and B cell lymphomas are the ones to worry about this a little bit more. Infection, any infection or almost any uh, type of infection seems to be able to create this response as well. But EBV is one to really keep you on high alert uh, because 74% of the infectious cases have been related to EBV in particular. And then rheumatologic uh, illnesses can also lead to this. Uh, it has a slightly different name, but it's essentially the same uh, illness. It's called uh, macrophage activation system when it's due to a rheumatologic cause. And um, this is uh, present in about 7 to 13 percent of children with rheumatologic illness. And juvenile arthritis is the most common, but it can happen with SLE, Stills, or Kawasaki. So this list just goes to show, I stole it from a paper, it just shows the variety of different causes of acquired um, HLH in adults or children. So as you can see, there's tons of viruses, uh, neoplasms, they can all cause it. I've mentioned some of the more common ones, but um, we're still just finding out about some of the triggers for this illness. In terms of pathophysiology, I'll try to keep this brief so people don't fall asleep, but um, normally in your body when you have um, an immune response, your natural killer cells are one of the first parts of that system to respond. They respond in two ways. One is that they release cytokines, which propagate and initiate the immune response. And they also bind to cells that are usually cancerous or infected. Uh, these cells are usually lacking an MH complex, which leads to the binding. And when it binds to these cells, um, they actually release cytotoxic proteins into the infected or cancerous cell, leading to apoptosis. The problem is that an HLH, either a genetic or viral cause, has led to a problem with this um, pathway, and you end up with no negative feedback because apoptosis never occurs. So when you lose negative feedback, you get an accumulation of cytokines, and this leads to what's called a cytokine storm. Cytokines uh, have multiple effects. I could only list a few here, um, but some of the things that they do is they suppress your appetite, they generate fever, they bring up your C-reactive protein, uh, attract neutrophils to the infection site, and in particular, they stimulate macrophage phagocytosis, which is a huge part of how these uh, patients present. So, Ultimately, this means you get multi-organ failure, which includes coagulopathy, shock, ARDS, renal failure, and ultimately death in many cases. So how do these patients look when they have cytokine storm? As you've seen with the first two cases, febrile illness with multi-organ involvement, and usually a history of recent infection. So in 52% of cases, there is that history. The classic signs and symptoms uh, being febrile of note neonates are not often febrile, so if you have a very young child, keep that in mind. Otherwise, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, elevated liver uh, tests, coagulopathy, cytopenia, and elevated ferritin. So just to put that in perspective of numbers and to give a little differentiation between the pediatric world and the adult world, uh, fever is present in 
almost all of these patients, so 96% of adults. And the stat I was able to find was 90% of pediatric cases. I suspect that that number looks a little bit smaller because of the contribution of neonates who are only uh, febrile in about 14% of cases. And then hepatosplenomegaly, very prominent in pediatric cases, a little bit less but still present in adults, and lymphadenopathy. The rest of the symptoms are variable, whether they're present or not, uh, and I think it just depends what organ system has been involved at first presentation. So um, if it's you know, pulmonary, you get ARDS, neurologic, renal, GI, um, dermatologic, or uh, liver, you get jaundice. So. And then in terms of blood work, similar um, depiction, peds versus adults. Um, the most uh, common thing to be elevated for both pediatric and adult patients is the ferritin level. Um, LD is often elevated as well, and then the cytopenias, as we saw, are very, very uh, important to look at. So there is diagnostic criteria for HLH. Uh, this diagnostic criteria was put together in 2004. So uh, what you're looking for is five of these things to be positive. And some of them are things we'll look at in the eMERGE, others are not. So febrile, over 38.5. Presence of splenomegaly, interestingly they don't have hepatomegaly on here, although it's just as prevalent, if not more prevalent, than splenomegaly in these patients. Uh, cytopenias of two lineages. And then elevated uh, triglycerides or low fibrinogen levels. You can also look at if there's uh, hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow, spleen or lymph nodes. Not something we do in the eMERGE, so I wouldn't worry about that. Low NK cell activity, again, not a test we would order in the eMERGE. Ferritin, very important to order, uh, can be very, very helpful. And soluble CD25, again, not something we would typically order in the eMERGE. So in terms of a bit of a, a literature review, the best study or the only study that has really looked at uh, treatment protocol for this was called HLH-94. It was created in 1994. Uh, they had a similar diagnostic criteria to the one I showed, but it was lacking uh, two or three of the elements. Those were only added in 2004. But they created a, created a treatment protocol and then followed patients looking at this treatment protocol. Obviously, a true RCT is not possible in this type of uh, situation where patients are incredibly sick and the cases are just uh, so rare that it's impossible to actually coordinate. So the treatment protocol they suggested was supportive care uh, as a must. They suggest transfer to a PCCU, um, or this study looked only at pediatrics, which is why it's PCCU, but you can translate this into the adult world, which is what most people do. Um, so transfer to PCCU and initially initiate HLA typing. This is because uh, stem cell transplant is the ultimate uh, curative treatment or thought to be the best curative treatment. So um, you can start that process. Providing broad spectrum antibiotics as well as uh, prophylactic antimycotics because as been mentioned, uh, these patients will receive chemotherapy. So the first eight weeks of treatment involves dexamethasone, etoposide, which is a form of chemotherapy, and intrathecal methotrexate, which is only used in patients with CNS symptoms, so uh, not very commonly done. And ultimately, the best treatment is to get these patients a uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And this is for all familial cases, and some of the acquired cases, depending on how they respond to the initial treatment, will go on to have a stem cell transplant. So in this study, they had looked at 25 countries, and their ultimate outcome was five-year survival. So how did these patients do with this treatment protocol? They included only children, as I mentioned, under the age of 16. They had to meet uh, the diagnostic criteria, as previously mentioned. They had to have no underlying malignancy, which does remove a significant portion of the patients. And uh, they had to have no prior treatment outside of steroids. In total, there were about 250 patients over a 10-year period, so this shows how difficult it is to do a study on this. Uh, they had a 91% retention at five years, 71% retention at 13 years. Um, they had an 86% survival at two months, and a 54% survival at five years, that's for all comers. But if the patients actually made it to get a stem cell transplant, patients with a stem cell transplant had a 60% survival.
So that really is your uh, best chance of survival, but still, as we've mentioned, that's uh, a relatively grim prognosis. There is a newer study, HLH 2004. Uh, this was started in 2004, and at that time, they decided to include children up to the age of 18, and they made a few changes to the diagnostic criteria from 1994. So their diagnostic criteria was the one that I showed you before, and what they added only in 2004 was the NK cell activity, soluble CD25, and importantly, the ferritin level. And they'll also include patients with a genetic diagnosis. Uh, their treatment protocol changed very slightly. They kept everything else the same, but they added cyclosporin during the first eight weeks, and they added IVIG as part of their supportive therapy, so it's not directly treating HLH, but they think it may have some benefit in terms of supportive therapy. Um, I suspect my best understanding was that this helps with the uh, cytopenias. This study ended in uh, 2011, but because they do a five-year uh, survival, uh, the results are still pending as they have to find those uh, outcomes. So what does this mean for us in the eMERGE department? That's a lot of information about a rare disease. How does this actually apply to us? Well, in the eMERGE department, um, you want to be initiating supportive care as you normally would. That doesn't change very much. Um, but you can also consider IVIG and uh, administration of blood products. The other thing that you could consider is the administration of dexamethasone. Uh, this can be done on your own if you felt comfortable doing it, um, or it could be done in conjunction with uh, hematology. It's also. I have to interject yeah. I don't think anyone in the eMERGE without a specialist involved who really knows what they're doing should be given any steroid or actually even making this diagnosis. That's in fair. The eMERGE. Really strongly, you should not give dexamethasone nor antifungals in the eMERGE. Okay. And that was something I actually wanted to bring up as a discussion point later, so I appreciate that, uh, that point. We weren't, uh, this isn't something we treat very often, and so I wanted to get the opinion of the crowd of whether you would administer or not, but uh, I appreciate that you're saying you feel strongly that it's not a safe thing to do, so thank you. Um, and I just want to bring back to our cases so you guys know how they uh, turned out. So for the first case, this was the 33-year-old gentleman. Uh, who presented to the eMERGE with upper respiratory tract infection and uh, abdominal pain. He ended up having a bone marrow biopsy. It confirmed HLH. He had PCR that showed uh, para-influenza virus. Uh, he had supportive care, including broad-spectrum antibiotics, um, and he had uh, prophylactic antibiotics and antifungals during his chemotherapy treatment. Uh, in terms of HLH-specific therapy, he got what is similar. It was a little different from the 2004 protocol, but mimicked the 2004 protocol um, as closely as possible with dexamethasone, uh, chemo, atoposide, and cyclosporin. He was considered for a stem cell transplant, but fortunately he responded very well to medical management only, and he didn't require that procedure. He is two years out um, in remission, according to the uh, case report that I read, and he was doing very well at that time. Our second case is actually a local case. This was a case seen here uh, in our emergency department, transferred to our ICU. Uh, this young lady, unfortunately, uh, with the EBV case, received pressors, uh, intubation, dialysis, multiple transfusions of um, packed red blood cells, FFP, cryo, broad spectrum antibiotics, and despite um, getting a true diagnosis of HLH with a bone marrow biopsy and appropriate treatment with dexamethasone and atoposide, uh, this patient actually passed away within about 48 hours of her presentation to our ICU. So again, what does this mean for us in the eMERGE department? So if you've been sleeping through this, it's time to wake up and, uh, and get just the bottom line, but early diagnosis and treatment is really important for HLH, and uh, it's important to remember that this is not just a pediatric diagnosis as it used to um, be thought of. It can actually present in adults and is becoming more and more recognized as such. And if you think you have a patient with HLH, you can actually do things to make a difference. So when should you think of it? If they have a history of malignancy, particularly a hematologic malignancy, a history of infection or EBV, uh, rheumatoid uh, disease, and if they have a history of familial HLH, that's obviously a given time when you would think about it. 
uh, on physical exam if they are febrile or septic and not responding to treatment for their sepsis. Um, if they have hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy, these are big triggers. And on our normal blood work that you would normally order in a patient presenting this way, uh, things that might uh, ring bells and help you remember that this diagnosis exists are cytopenias and elevated transaminases. So what would you do if you actually suspected HLH? Initiate supportive care, antibiotics, fluids, pressors if necessary. Remember that there is di diagnostic criteria. If you don't remember what it is, look it up. Um, and you can contact ICU and hematology as soon as possible. Getting their involvement means you can administer treatments um, that are more directed uh, with the correct specialists involved as soon as possible. And um, you can order blood work that may help the admitting service with uh, their diagnosis. So make sure you have a differential on your CBC, fibrinogen, triglycerides, ferritin, very important, D-dimers. If you don't have LFTs, you can order them, and an LDH. So those were my many, many references. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, or if you'd like to discuss further your thoughts on if you'd do anything differently with a case like this. Yep. In my experience, in having to call hematology to get advice on things, is they're usually very easy to get a hold of. They're very helpful. So I think in these kinds of scenarios, obviously, to involve them early, um, even if it means you know this person's clearly getting admitted, just to get that phone call to get some stuff started. And even for simple cases, something like maybe ITP and that, usually just discuss with them, and they're usually good to know. Do you have any comments, Dr. Salvadori? I know you've, you seem to have a bit more knowledge about this than... Well, I have an unfair, bit unfair <laughs> advantage because obviously they're often infectious. Mm -hmm. I actually just, I, I thought that was superbly done. It's an actually extremely difficult topic and every time I come to talk on it, it's, I didn't know that's what this was about today, but it's so in depth and I think that all of us who just work on the front line, which is the vast majority of physicians, take home messages if something, if they're really sick out of proportion, particularly if they're a young, normal person, now you know to order a ferritin. And if it's off the chart, you know to call for help. And I, I think that you gave us enough understanding that we know the importance and yet know what to do. So I really commend you. Those are outstanding rounds. Just Thank to you. further your knowledge, maybe just a little bit, um, one of the things that I think many adult people probably don't know yet and is actually really interesting that has changed the practice of pediatrics is that most of those babies who get really sick, so those who, that get really sick and they all used to die, we actually are now starting to know that they're skids or severe combined immune deficiencies. That's why they all did better with bone marrow transplants because they had abnormal immune systems to start with. And what you may not know is that Ontario is really leading edge right now. There's only a few jurisdictions in the world that we're actually now screening all babies for skids. So it's something called a TREC. It's a T lymphocyte, as the T lymphocyte goes from being born to being totally mature, bits of DNA are cast off. So we look for that track, and we also look in our jurisdiction for something called adenosine deaminase deficiency, because our Mennonite population has it. So 70% now, not 100%, but 70% of these weird skid, immune deficiencies, bizarro things that none of us could ever have picked up. And they were frequently the babies who came in and died, and then we all felt like crap for months afterwards, not understanding why we couldn't save them. They're actually being picked up at birth and preemptively going to bone marrow transplant now. So it's something that is a really big change in practice and kind of interesting. Do you know how long it takes to get a ferritin back? Ferritin's really quick back. So really quick back. Yeah, so like, like it's as fast as CRPs and things like that. So Chantel, I noticed your diagnostic criteria had ferritin like in the, uh, I think it was like American units. Do you know what it would be? Um, yeah, I had trouble finding all Canadian units. Um, over 500, I believe that was in the American units. So it's 10,000 is diagnostic in Canada for ferritin, but if, so over 10,000 is absolutely diagnostic. 
then there's a range, because it's an acute phase reactant too. So generally the problem is we get these two or three or five thousands, and I think we're a bit over calling HLH, to be quite honest, on our side, and we're doing chemo where maybe it's not indicated. But over 10,000 is absolute, and the two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand range is helpful. I have a question for you, actually, since it's nice to talk to someone who may have actually treated someone with this. Um, so you're saying over 10,000 is usually considered diagnostic and they'll go for treatment. Um, but if they're, are you normally using like the HLH 2004 diagnostic criteria or how do you go about that? So we, we would use the 2004 diagnostic criteria, but most of these patients are actually too sick in the moment. And it's, this is not, it's not, this is not even like say, rheumatic fever, you know, where we all go, what is it really, and two of these criteria, one of these, and all, it's really in evolution. And I, I, I have always deferred to our hematologists, and quite honestly, we often end up having two or three different groups with completely opposing opinions. And because the other diagnosis is often sepsis, and you don't want to give chemotherapy to someone who has herpes in their blood, so it's, which has happened. So it's actually a very, I would not in any way pretend to say it's black and white, and I also don't, I don't feel like I am an expert on it and have a good handle on it, but I think there's, the hematology is very, very helpful. So, yeah, I, I, I think thinking of it and doing the ferritin is really the most important message, and then let other people battle it out, whether you should treat or it is or it's not. Thank you. But 2004 is what we've tended to use. The okay. soluble D, the CD whatever soluble thing, it's not available in London. Last time I looked, we have to actually send it to sick kids. Okay. And uh, so that's not something we get back quickly.